ゴジラ !1999's Godzilla 2000 Millennium, directed by Takawa Okawara. We have arrived at the millennium era of Godzilla films, and I've been looking forward to this because, for the exception of the movie I'm covering in this video, I've never watched any of the other millennium films. I'm especially excited to watch 2001's GMK from what I've seen and heard, but let's start with Godzilla 2000. After 1998's movie, my nine year old self wanted another American Godzilla film to be made immediately, one that, in my mind, did it right. And apparently I wasn't alone. The backlash from longtime Godzilla fans was loud and clear. They wanted the old Godzilla back. Though I will say I noticed from some of your comments on my last video that Emmerich and Devlin's movie was actually a lot of people's introduction to Godzilla, so there is definitely a portion of the fanbase that view that movie in a positive light. It should also be noted that TriStar's Godzilla wasn't the only monster movie made around this time. South Korea produced a reimagining of the 1967 film Yangari Monster from the Deep called Yangari. In the US, it would be distributed under the name Reptilian. But anyway, TriStar's movie definitely helped spread the brand. But usually, the most unhappy people are the loudest, and Toho heard them. Toho would begin production on a new Godzilla film two months after TriStar's Godzilla released. Producer Shogo Tomiyama would say, We had no plans for another Godzilla film until the year 2005. We had a feeling that after seeing TriStar's film, we couldn't keep the Japanese Godzilla silent until 2005. Tomiyama didn't just plan on making one Godzilla film either. He envisioned a trilogy of movies. TriStar was still technically able to make Godzilla movies until 2003. In fact, Emmerich was in the process of negotiating a sequel with Sony. So Toho had to be careful not to be too obvious and, well, insulting in regards to the perception that this new production was a rebuke to Emmerich's film. Toho would release an official statement to ease any misconceptions saying they were gracious for Emmerich's film, though as we will see there are some obvious digs at the TriStar film in Godzilla 2000 Millennium. Tomiyama would bring back Takawa Okawara as director, and for writers Hiroshi Kashiwabara, the man who wrote Godzilla vs. Space Godzilla, and Wataru Mimura, one of the first orders of business was to figure out what this new monster would look like. Shinichi Wakaza and the Monster Inc. team would converse with Tomiyama and Okawara on this topic. Okawara wanted this new Godzilla's size to be reduced to 55 meters, only 5 meters bigger than the original. The Heisei Godzilla had gotten so big that according to Okawara, the distance between human beings and Godzilla was too much. The new suit would make the dorsal fins much larger and jagged with a slight shade of purple. The scars or grooves on the suit are more prominent, and its head is much more proportionate to its body. In some ways, it's like the King Goji suit from 1962's King Kong vs. Godzilla. The eyes are white with black pupils like the 1984 look, and unlike the 1962 suit, this design has ears. This is also the first movie where Godzilla is actually green, despite movie posters and the Hanna-Barbera cartoon making the monster appear green. The old suits were always either charcoal or black. Stuntman Tsutomu Kitagawa would take over for the retired Kenpachiro Satsuma and take on the role of Godzilla. Kitagawa had recently played King Ghidorah in Rebirth of Mothra 3 and also had experience on the Super Sentai series. The story in Millennium starts off with Shinoda and his daughter Io tracking Godzilla as they're part of the Godzilla Prediction Network. Shinoda is played by Takahiro Murata who played the corporate lackey in Godzilla vs. Mothra. Io, who acts more mature for her age, is played by child actress Mayo Suzuki, and both characters have a nice chemistry. While tracking Godzilla, they're joined by reporter Yuki Ichinose, played by Naomi Nishida, who wants to get pics of the giant monster. And boy does she, and we get to see the worst CG shattered glass of all time. In this film, Godzilla is a destructive force of nature that comes ashore Japan every now and then to feed on humanity's energy sources. It's mostly impervious to conventional weaponry, though the full metal missiles do seem to do some damage. 
However, this Godzilla is similar to the Heisei version, as it has the ability to heal itself through regeneration. This movie's explanation for that is Organizer G1, a substance inside Godzilla's cells. The monster's atomic breath packs more of a punch than usual, perhaps to compensate for 1998's fish burps. This new Godzilla would also sport a new roar. The music for the film was composed by Takayuki Hattori, the same man who did the music for Godzilla vs. Space Godzilla. The movie never explicitly says if this is the same Godzilla from 1954 or not, but later Toho would confirm that he is the second Godzilla of this film's continuity, after the original attacked Tokyo in 1954. As we'll see going forward, the Millennium Era films almost all have their own separate continuity with a connection to the original film or some sort of altered history from that movie. With Kochi Kawakita retiring, Kenji Suzuki would become the new special effects director. Suzuki was assistant director under Kawakita on multiple films, so he wasn't new to the giant monster genre. During the Heisei era, Kawakita's little machines and miniatures were intrinsic, and a lot of effort went into them. Suzuki was more into the new technology of the time, using chroma key and other digital tools which were used to have this new Godzilla inserted into video of real cities, rather than relying on just miniatures alone. Sometimes it didn't look too bad. Other times? Eh, it was pretty rough. However, none of this stopped Toho from adding their very first fully CG Godzilla shot. Despite the new look and era, we still get to see Godzilla square off against the Japanese self-defense forces, just like old times. They've blended the old with the new, having the full metal missiles that were built up earlier rendered in CG when fired, but the explosions and smoke are practical effects. The standout performance in the film was Hiroshi Abe as Mitsu Katagiri. Katagiri is the human antagonist of the film and the leader of Crisis Control Intelligence. His mission is to destroy Godzilla by any means necessary. He's the anti-Shinoda. As I've watched more Japanese films outside of Kaiju Ega, I've stumbled across director Hirokazu Koraeda. Abe's in numerous Koraeda films and brings a strong presence with him. For those interested in Japanese films with no giant monsters in it, I recommend After the Storm, which Abe stars in, Shoplifters, Like Father Like Son, and Still Walking, which Abe stars in as well. Point is, watch Koraeda films. They're worth it. Anyway, Abe's Katagiri character in Godzilla 2000 Millennium is so over the top that it comes off as comical and cheesy, but in a good way. Scientist Shiro Miyazaka is played by Shiro Sano, a lifelong Godzilla fan himself. He added in a little part, adjusting his tie as a nod to the 1954 original, where Takashi Shimura's Dr. Yamane character adjusts his tie, possibly the only tiny piece of intended humor in the original. Katagiri and the movie spend a lot of time on Godzilla's nemesis. We have ourselves another alien in the Godzilla universe. The Millennians are aliens who crash-landed in Earth's ocean. The lack of sun caused the ship to remain dormant until humanity discovers it, setting the plot of this movie in motion. The Millennians soon come across Godzilla while flying around in the massive ship. This is a great shot, just to show the size of the ship juxtaposed to Godzilla. The two engage in a fun beam battle that sees Godzilla get blasted into the ocean. I love the little head motion Kitagawa does here before firing off the atomic breath. Those slight movements add to the illusion of power that the atomic breath contains. After seemingly winning its beam battle with Godzilla, the aliens conclude that the monster is the most powerful life form on Earth due to the monster's Organizer G1 substance. Humanity's weapons are useless against this foe, so it's humanity's greatest mistake that becomes their only hope. <laughs> Ultimately, no matter who the composer is for these films, the Akira Ifakube motifs need to be thrown in from time to time. Not doing it would be like having a James Bond film without the Godzilla and the Millennium Spaceship rematch begins with the spaceship utilizing cables to knock down Godzilla and constrict him. There's also another good use of CG mixed with the practical effects, as the CG cables wrap around the dorsal fins and then the real cables are seen here. I think this battlefield is the crew's most impressive feat in the film. Godzilla's dorsal fins and the charge up in general to the atomic breath is no longer just for aesthetics. 
It actually heats up his body and is useful in setting him free before firing a blast at the spaceship. The aliens start to mutate using Godzilla's DNA, and this part doesn't look great. When in this form, the Millennium looks like the spaceships from Jumping Flash. As Godzilla turns his attention to the Millennium, we see that instead of them turning into a Godzilla clone, they can't control the Organizer G1, and instead transform into the monstrous Orga. Orga has the ability to fire a beam from its shoulder and can telepathically control the Millennium spaceship. He also has some big mitts that he bops Godzilla with. It should be noted a lot of Orga concept art was drawn before the making of this movie. There we go, a nice wide angle shot with the monsters in view and the miniatures around them. This is the monster action I enjoy. I mean, this is just a fun and well planned out fight with a lot going on. The spaceship knocks Godzilla down while he's distracted with Orga, and Godzilla has had enough with that damn thing. Enough from spaceship. Orga gets clipped by the attack as well, and just as it looks defeated, we see the Organizer G1 is already working its magic, with some nicely placed CG effects. The regenerating Orga re-engages with Godzilla by doing this. Even Godzilla is like, the fuck? A monster trying to eat Godzilla is something that had come up a few times in the makings of different Godzilla films. Here we see it realized in all its awkwardness. Though Orga gaining dorsal fins is pretty awesome, and of course the conclusion is worth it as well. Godzilla utilizes its nuclear pulse ability, another bring back from the Heisei era. Pieces of Orga go everywhere, and Godzilla is victorious as the humans look on in a nicely matted shot. But as if just to remind people that this Godzilla is by no means humanity's friend, he walks towards the main characters where Katagiri stares down his nemesis. Katagiri has been triply defeated, losing to the aliens and Godzilla, and having to watch Godzilla clean up his mess. In an overly dramatic moment that probably wasn't meant to be funny, Katagiri essentially commits Harakiri by Godzilla. Godzilla! Letting the King of Monsters send him to his death after his shameful failures. The movie ends in a way that's pretty unique in terms of Godzilla films. Normally, we would see Godzilla peacefully go back to the ocean after defeating his foe. Here, he actually continues to destroy Shinjuku. There's no plan to stop him, nothing. Humanity simply accepts Godzilla's destruction like the force of nature he is, and the credits roll. Godzilla 2000 Millennium would open up in Japanese theaters on December 11th, 1999, and would go on to sell 2 million tickets and earn $15 million. For reference, Toho's last outing with Godzilla vs. Destroya earned $18 million dollars, respectively. So this wasn't necessarily a big hit financially in Japan, and critics were pretty mixed. The US version of this film was planned to be distributed by TriStar, and originally the film was dubbed in English by Omni Productions, but when the people at TriStar saw it, they deemed it too poor in quality to distribute, so they sought to re-edit it and make an Americanized version of the film. We've been down this road before with the original film and Godzilla 1984, both being heavily altered and their titles changed for the US release. However, this time Okawara and Toho would have to give approval on a lot of the changes before they were done. Godzilla 2000 Millennium would be turned simply into Godzilla 2000 for its US release. Mike Schlesinger would be in charge of this Americanization process, and I have to say that the dubbing slash looping of the English voices is done well. They didn't take a buzzsaw to the film or add any scenes. Instead, they just would move around some dialogue and cut some footage to speed some scenes up. They also added some campiness and humor to the lines. For example, adding in a line from the movie Patton when talking about the full metal missiles. I guarantee it'll go through Godzilla like crap through a goose. 
The sound for the film was heavily reworked, with added in sound effects and new music composed by John Peter Robinson to go with Hattori's score. A pretty neat change I noticed was at the end of the film they used King Ghidorah's theme from 1964 in an unexpected throwback. Originally, the American version that was released in theaters ended with a goofy-looking graphic saying, The End? Very Showa era. But Toho didn't like it, so it got taken out of the videos and DVD releases, but was accidentally kept in the Spanish subtitle VHS release. At times, they changed Godzilla's roar, and at first I thought they were reusing the TriStar Godzilla's cry. And we should point out that you created the the new Godzilla roar. I mean, you, you, you made these from scratch, inspired by the original Godzilla roar. Some people thought that we had reused the roar from the Emmerich version, but we did not because we actually... We didn't use any of the Emmerichs. No, I don't think we, we even had the, the ability to. Yeah, we, we, yeah. Everything we created was new. everything from what the original stuff was like from the original Godzilla. Right. You sure? Yeah. Orga's roar in the original version is a stock roar from Cretaceous King Ghidorah from Rebirth of Mothra 3. The American version would be marketed with a few trailers that used Rob Zombie's Super Beast in the background. Get ready. I spotted him. For the 23rd big screen appearance of the world's biggest star. Godzilla! From TriStar Pictures and Toho Company Limited, catch the ultimate showdown. It's an alien! Where winner takes all. Godzilla 2000. If you can't take the heat, run. I thought this was awesome because I was a Twisted Metal fan growing up and Rob Zombie was usually associated with those games. Also, his music was used for a lot of fan-made Dragon Ball Z music videos in the early 2000s. Godzilla 2000 would be released in roughly 2,000 select theaters in the U.S. on August 18, 2000 and made a little over $10 million respectively. Even the folks at Toho and Okawara himself were impressed by TriStar's version of the film. This would lead to another reverse import situation and Toho would distribute TriStar's Godzilla 2000 in Japan for a limited time. A manga would be produced based on the movie and it took some pretty dark liberties, with the Millennians transforming into a giant mass of flesh with screaming faces before becoming Orga. Orga would appear in future Godzilla media, including the first film of the Netflix trilogy, Godzilla, Planet of the Monsters, where the creature is reported to have killed millions in the country of Turkey. Schlesinger's success with the Americanized version gave him the idea to push for an American-made sequel. In this proposed film, Godzilla would fight a lava monster that resembled a bat called Miba, with the film taking place in Hawaii. Sony would eventually reject the idea, despite Toho being okay with it. Sony claimed they weren't in the business of making low-budget films. They were in the Spider-Man business at this point. Within a vacuum, Godzilla 2000 Millennium is a fun movie in its own right, but I think the context of bringing back the quote-unquote real Godzilla is a big part of what made this movie relatively well-liked amongst fans. <laughs> If TriStar's Godzilla didn't happen, perhaps the movie is never made. Ultimately, I think the two are somewhat inseparable when one is discussed. This is the last Godzilla film I ever forced my dad to watch with me. I think he fell asleep about 15 minutes in. This would also be the last Godzilla film I watched as a kid, and I wouldn't watch another until 2014's Godzilla. Once the smoke cleared and the numbers came in, the Japanese market's reaction to Godzilla 2000 Millennium had Tomiyama reconsidering the idea of creating a trilogy. 
Instead, he decided the next movie would have its own continuity once again. Toho was going to try and explore different things with each subsequent standalone film. Godzilla as a product wasn't much of a risk at this point. He was cemented in Japanese culture. A small example of this is a little before Godzilla 2000 Millennium came out, a giant Godzilla slide was built in Kurahama as a fun attraction. If your country's building landmarks of your fictional character, then you probably have nothing to worry about. Godzilla wasn't going anywhere. The thing is, the expected returns lately were modest at best. Tomiyama wanted to see if he could hit the jackpot with one of these experiments. That leads us to the second movie in the Millennium Era. Next up is 2000's Godzilla vs. Megaguirus. 